Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Biomimicry Immersion Engineering Ideas session today. It's my pleasure to be your moderator for the session today. I'm Masu Gang, and on behalf of Women Engineers Section, the Institution of Engineers Malaysia, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. We appreciate you taking time off your busy schedule to join us here today. The Biomimicry session today is designed to help you brainstorm ideas unleash your creativity, fine-tune your creative output, and most importantly, to ask questions to help you with ideas on, in, uh, on your next innovation ideas, for, especially for our Biomimicry Engineering Challenge. Um, our Biomimicry Engineering Challenge for your info is still accepting submissions until 19 March 2022. If you are interested, remember to register yourself at World Engineering Day dot my and send in your submissions before Saturday, 19 March 2022. This afternoon, we are very honored for the opportunity to, of having experts in bio. Dr. Laura Lee Stevens is an architect, engineer, biomimicry expert, and nature lover of great outdoors. She, taught, she holds two master's degrees in the field of architecture from Delft University of Technology and biomimicry from Arizona State University. She completed her PhD at Delft University of Technology, where she researched how students were enriched through learning to translate analogies from bi biology to design using biomimicry. She is a professional biomimicry design educator in her role as a professor in the Industrial Design Engineering Program at the Hecht University of Applied Science in the Netherlands. Her goal is to enhance circular, systems thinking solutions in design by learning from time-tested biological strategies and mechanisms found in nature. She has become entrailed by the technical elements these translations bring, but understands that without ensuring ethical design decisions and without reconnecting to nature itself, she would be missing the point of biomimicry design to contribute to the sustainability of solutions. Her talk today, Biomimicry, Learning from Nature, will focus on inspiring the youth with beautiful analogies from nature that rally them to be responsible engineers. Dr. Laura Lee Stevens, good morning there in Netherlands, and over to you from us here in Malaysia. Good morning. Yeah. It's afternoon where you are, and you know I was just blown away by the talk before me, so I think it's very interesting how AI will be uh, the future, but also I was wondering how can the AI, how can you do that when you're outside in nature? Because that's where I really love to be. And if there's any questions, we'll have plenty of time at the end. So uh, feel free to jump in there. Well, I've already been introduced. So I don't have to tell you again uh, who I am and what I've studied, but I really, really am a, a passionate fan of biomimicry. I've learned it at Arizona State University, as she already told you. And uh, I teach it to my students at the Hague University. And I see the changes that go through their design phases, because I've, I've taught industrial design engineering before that I taught biomimicry. And now I see the students really dive into the nature and the, the strategies and mechanisms of nature. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about how they do it and how they're learning. Now, most of you might know the saying from Muhammad Ali, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Your can hands can't hit, but your eyes can't see. Now that's an analogy from how does nature protect itself? So I thought that was a nice way to start off. My goal is to empower learners to create a sustainable future through ecosystem services and changing the way we approach the climate challenges, for example. That's the overarching mission. And why did I start teaching this? Well, I, I had been learning biomimicry and I've been talking to my students about it and teaching a little bit about how you can look to nature and look at the mechanisms and strategies in nature and apply them to your design. But I saw a problem. There were students who were just mimicking nature without really looking at the function. And I thought it was such a shame because 
just by copying a honeycomb, for example, and putting that into a Heisen project doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be sustainable. It doesn't also necessarily mean it's going to be biomimicry. And I was afraid that students were going towards superficial biomimicry, which is what I call it, which is not looking enough into the the, the function and not really fully understanding the translation between the biology into the design. It was one of the problems that was noticed overall in the biomimicry world. So I thought I would look to see how can we improve that. And of course, the Hague University is also a UNESCO associated school. And every single challenge that we look at looks to serve the sustainable development goals. And, and you know, if a challenge is not real and relevant and awe-inspiring, and if it doesn't uh, increase your inquis inquisitiveness, then something must change in your learning process. So biomimicry, as I said before in the, in the intro, biomimicry is not simply translating the, the strategies and the mechanisms to nature. That's a part of it. That's the emulate part, where you look at the forms like the distal that goes into, that has been translated into Velcro, where you look like, look at the termite hills and see how that is used in the Eastgate building in Zimbabwe. And also looking at the lotus leaves to see how that structure has helped make these facades on buildings uh, self-cleaning. So that's the emulate part. But if you do not think about your ethical design decisions, the ethos, then you might be missing the point. If you make something that is contributing to sustainability, but you have it made in sweatshops or with children's fingers, then you might be missing the point, I think. Another third element of biomimicry, which is just as important, is that reconnection to nature. With all the, the digital resources we have these days, which are wonderful, we, we need to remember why we're doing this and who are those mentors out there that, that give you this inspiration and that give you this knowledge. So if you don't connect these three elements, the, the ethical design decisions, reconnecting to nature with your creation process, then yeah, you might as well call it something else because it's not biomimicry. So with biomimicry design thinking, it's the same circle of uh, design thinking. The, you start out with scoping out your challenge, you define the context. It's really important to know who your stakeholders are and what they need their design, their solution to do. So that's when you identify the function. And that function is, 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 should be a specific verb or, or use that uh, that, that scientists or biologists will use to define what is happening here. So you identify the function. That's one of the first things. What do you want your design to do? And we'll get to this a little bit later, but then you integrate life's principles and life's principles are the overarching patterns that all life abides by. And if you introduce them at the beginning, you can also measure them at the end. You're the different design ideas that you've come up with, you can measure them as, uh, use them as benchmarks to check off how well do your design ideas fit these overarching patterns. So how well does it fit within the ecosystem it needs to survive? Then it's time to discover the natural models. And that's like the most exciting part. It takes a lot of time to dive into the scientific journal articles of each of these organisms that actually do this function that you already pinpointed. And what happens most of the time, it takes, let's say 20 hours to dive into each organism and learning about this one specific function and learning about the strategy and then how the strategy is working, that would be the mechanism. But that has been not only the most difficult or time consuming, but also the most rewarding. That's what students have said in their surveys that I put out because I've been doing research this in biomimicry education for five years now. And students have said this is the most rewarding, just really diving into nature and finding that these incredible organisms that can build structures in ambient temperatures. So we don't need the hot ovens like, uh, like, like we humans use. We can um, use 
uh, available and uh, local materials and energy instead of going across the world to get these energies and materials. So the, discover the natural models and then abstract those strategies and those mechanisms into a design language that designers can use to start off their design ideation. And then you go into the brainstorming and come up with different kinds of design that's inspired by these natural models. And then you create, you'll make different prototypes. And then once you have one that you like the best or a few that you like the best, then you can measure them using those same life's principles that I just talked about. So the diving into the biological uh, research is really important. What does the design need to do? And these are some examples of what students have been looking at for at the top, you can see the urban heat islands which are occurring around the world. There's more and more forest fires, there's more and more fires and, and heated up cities who, who cannot seem to cool down. So where can we look to nature to find answers? to solve these challenges. So you can look to the prairie dog, for example, or the, the termites as has already been uh, um, talked about. The students will draw these different organisms on the blackboard in the innovation playground where I teach at the Hague University. And this is inspiring, not just to them, but also to their colleagues, uh, students who are also learning about different organisms, but also the whole school. They love to come in and take selfies at these, uh, at, on these drawings behind them because it's just so inspiring. And the students know really the nitty gritty of the, the mechanisms and the strategies. Even though they're not biologists, they have dived into the biology, into scientific journal articles to find the real information that biologists have done a lot and a lot of research on. So it's coming, it's all based on biological research. And below you can see an example of where a student team looked into different organisms that filter particles because they were looking to filter the the nanoparticles, the microparticles of plastic that are in the oceans. So you see each of the challenges that our students work on are real and relevant challenges that the world needs to tackle as soon as possible. So how do we translate those analogies from the biology into the design? As I said before, first you determine that design context and function need. Then you learn about the possible requirements that you could add, because before you start designing, you need to know what kind of requirements. In industrial design engineering at our school, our students will be asking, why are we designing something in the first place? Because there's already a lot of things out there. So we only want to design good things, things that will make our world better, to solve the challenges that we have, to solve, to help contribute to the sustainable development goals. So you look at requirements, that, uh, for example, um, designers will need to learn to use a, a small subset of components, a small subset of elements like Nate does. Let's say you want to package something really tightly so you could fit more of these packages into the container that goes to the, the, the shop or gets sold. Like IKEA does, they have small, amount of number uh, of elements within the design and they package them as tightly as possible. So the, the requirement could be use modular nested components. And that's one of life's principles. Look at, um, look at the pine cones, look at any seed pod that's out there, how it packages its materials to be used for later. So these are really good lessons we can learn from. Then, as I said before, you dive into the biology as many as possible and you put this into a scheme so you can have a whole list of biology of different organisms that already solve this function. So you look at the different scientific articles, you write down the, the common name, the scientific name, you will look at the, the, the mechanism or the strategy that the organism has to solve this function. And then that's how it's solving the function, but then describing even deeper Maybe there's a, a, a specific scale that the, um, that the design needs to work in, that the biology works in. So when you blow it up, then that scale, that, that grid for a filter, for example, wouldn't work anymore. So you have to take all of these things into consideration. So discovering a lot of different organisms 
that already solved this challenge helps you look to see which one is most applicable for your design. Then you pinpoint the variety of the different strategies and mechanisms from the biology. To translate the abstracted design principles, that is the biggest um, obstacle that students have acquired. So let's say you have uh, found and, and focused and you found a strategy mechanism that you can put into a, a succinct summary and then you have it right there. It's three or four sentences. This is how this organism solves the problem. Then you would highlight all those biological terms because you want to translate the biology to design. So then you have the summary, you highlight the biological terms such as, um, such as an organism. Now that or an organism, this organism would become a unit or a covering or whatever it is, but you take out those biological terms and you translate them to something, to a, a designer language as it was. Once you've done this, then you have an abstracted design principle text. And you can test that text to see if it's working by having other students draw what you have already written. This is a really good, it's called the draw test. So have they understood the text or do you need to change a little bit so you can understand it? And that's what you can do together to help improve your abstracted design principle. And I, I'm available if any students want to contact me later, you can find me on LinkedIn and I can help you a little bit with this translation of the abstracted design principles from the bio, biological design principles to the design principles. It's, it's a step-by-step -step process. You start with the biology, you pinpoint the biological terms, the, the summary of that, and then translate those biological terms in that summary to design language. Words like uh, central or fins or ribs, those are words that you can still use in the new translated uh, principles and then drawing it. Once you've drawn a, a diagram of your abstracted design principle, then you can start ideation, come up with all kinds of ideas that fit that abstracted design principle. And students, you can see the students all working here on the tables, trying to uh, figure out what the others have drawn and what the others have learned, what they've written, and then uh, come up with as many ideas. They could also combine to abstracted design principle, principles, because as we know, nature is multifunctional. So, but start by, with one, just so you can understand how to make that translation. Then combine, come up with a lot of ideas, and then you will choose the suitable ideas and measure these through the life's principles. I can also provide you with the life's principles if you don't have those. Here are some examples of how students have dived into the biology and discovering the strategies and mechanisms of the biology. They might find on asknature.org is, a, is a, an, an encyclopedia of all kinds of organisms. Now, hopefully you know this already. Uh, I don't know how many, uh, how far you are in your biomimicry education. So I'll just dive in and tell a little bit about how we do this. Now, the students have looked at specific problems. For example, the liana vines, they were looking to transport water. So when you have storm flooding, what organisms in the jungle can, um, can provide with transportation of water? So the lianas are really well known for their transportation of fluids. And they looked at the scientific articles and they write down this, this succinct summary of what is the strategy and the mechanisms. For the octopus, this, this student team was looking at how to uh, change color. They were looking at circular textiles. So perhaps you don't need to use pigment, perhaps, perhaps you don't need to use different colors or have five different shirts or blouses because the blouse would change color. So they would look in to see how the octopus would change color. And then trying, here is an example of the diagrams that you show to explain as closely as possible what is happening within this organism to make this function of change color happen. And then again, with the stingless bee, we were looking at ventilation uh, options within buildings to, to deal with 
humidity to deal with the, the intense heat in the jungle. So this was a project in Costa Rica. And the strategy of the stingless bee would have this ventilation through its nest that with a small hole in one entrance and another hole in the other entrance. And the strategy would have these different compartments that would have layers to keep the comb insulated and the temperature constant. So this was a, a, a beautiful strategy to look at. And that, that was something that could also be translated into a design, different kinds of facades, for example, you could look at the stingless bee to see how you could make a layered structure with a, an entrance and an exit for that ventilation. The leaf cutter ant, for example, would, uh, would localize for food resources, just one tree, and they will take, take the path to that one tree. And what's really interesting is that other leafcutter ants will not cross that path. They will stay away and they'll choose another direction. So this could be a really uh, interesting, interesting strategy to look at logistics, but also to look at uh, cooperation instead of competition in nature. So depending on what your challenge is, you could look at the different organisms. One of the things in biomimicry is that it follows three different levels. You could be mimicking the form, for example, the form or the structure, how something is built and how that affects the, the outcome. So how that affects the function. So the, the form of the, the antlers, for example, might increase the sound of a receiver. And students look to this to apply it to an acoustics problem. You could also look at the process and process is behavior, uh, something that is happening in the, in the organism. So this was a, a matter of tightening cells or loosening cells to get different color structures, different pigments on the fish. That's a behavior process. So if you need something that will tighten or loosen up, you could look at this Atlantic cod, for example. But let's say you're looking at systems and it's, it's, on one hand, it might be the hardest to mimic a system because it is so complex and there's so many relationships, there's so many functions uh, within an ecosystem that on one hand, it might seem very difficult. But if you take this ecosystem metaphorically or really pinpoint within the system, what do you need to do and where can you have the most impacts, impact, then you look at the system as a whole. For example, if you're looking at the different levels in a tropical rainforest to see what are the sun levels, what is the humidity level, and what is the wind level or the temperature level. And at different levels, different organisms will thrive. So if you're looking to build homes in the jungle, for example, you might build them in zone two because it's not too hot from the sun, it's not too dark from being down at the bottom, at the base of the forest, but it is right in the perfect temperature and perfect breeze. So what organisms live there and how can you mimic that system? These are the three sorts of analogies that you use in biomimicry. So you can mimic form, you can mimic process or behavior, and you can mimic an entire ecosystem. An example of form and process analogy is when we were looking at the humidity, for example, looking at how the giant air plant does this. And as I said before, you have the strategy, you look these up in the scientific journal articles, you've got the strategy, you, you understand that from three or four different uh, scientific journal articles because you need to base your information on yeah, vetted work, vetted biological uh, scientific journal articles. So not just from Wikipedia or not just from uh, any web or a blog, it really needs to come from the scientific journal articles that have been peer reviewed to, to see how something actually is working. So you've got the strategy and the mechanism of the giant air plant. So for looking at how it deals with humidity, how it deals with water absorption, water collection, uh, water dispersion, you could look at these, these tiny trichomes that are on the surface of the giant air plant and look deeper. So when it, the plant is dry, it would have these 
the, the shape that would to collect water. And more and more water will come into the interior of the walls, swelling it up and causing it to, to form in the other direction to close off the water and seal it in. So it's when it's dry, it has one position. And when it's totally full, then it can take on another position. And this happens without any kind of extra energy from our part putting into it. It's a mechanism that automatically works, just like the pine cone that will automatically open when it dries and close when it is wet. So it will open when it dry, and when it's dry and disperse its seed. You can see how the student goes from the strategy and the mechanism and really understanding the trichomes that are on the surface of the giant air plant and how this might be used if you are building a home and create an entire surface with these kind of cells that will collect water when there's too much and seal off the water when there's too little and it will uh, contain it for further use when necessary. Another example of form and process analogy for looking at the changing of color again, we could look at the chameleon. So when the chameleon is tightening its cells or loosening up its cells, it will have these different layers will take on different colors. So it's all about how the chameleon is doing this. And I have an example of the abstracted design principle. This is text I was talking about. After taking that, that uh, summary of the strategy and the mechanism, then you translate it by taking out the biological terms. So you could say for the chameleon, the upper and lower layers contain, I can't quite see this, contain colors with a layer in between that contains reflective nanocrystals that form a lattice. The perceived color of the upper layer is altered when the spacing between the nanocrystals is adjusted. So that is, this uh, student has done this and it's just a beginning to understand how the chameleon is changing colors. And as you see, there's some references underneath because it's very important to have this vetted information in there. Um, yeah. So what do we learn throughout this process of learning biomimicry and how the, the students have learned biomimicry? What did we learn as educators? And here you can see the life principles. This is the life principle diagram where I was talking about, for example, using um, modular nested components, but also that self-organize of the, the leaf cutter ant and using low energy processes, using multifunctional design. All of these principles, and you could debate whether they belong in be locally tuned and responsive or integrate development with growth. That's not the point. The point is these are the basic principles that all life abides by. So if you uh, incorporate diversity, for example, you won't have something central because if that central unit is wiped out, then you have nothing. But if you have a, a diversity of different places with that function going on, then uh, you are a lot safer. Also uh, cultivating cooperative relationships. When you are working on a project, look out to your stakeholders and see how you can incorporate your stakeholders into your project. What do they need? And how can you create mutualistic relationships within these stakeholders? So do the different stakeholders have something that they can bring into the whole that they can easily offer? And is there something that the other stakeholders have that could help them? That, that constant exchange of having something that the other stakeholders have and being able to adapt to the changing conditions, that is, is embodies the mutualistic relationships that you really need to look at when you're doing a project. So you can go through these nice principles and see how can you adjust your design to fit these life's principles better? Because the better you do, the better it's going to fit within the ecosystem. So we found out that the translation from the biological uh, summary, the biological strategies and mechanisms to engineering was difficult. That was the emulate. That's the essential element of biomimicry called emulate, that creation element. There were cues about form and process and system missing. So I added these cues. Have you mimicked form today? Have you mimicked a process of behavior today? Or have you mimicked system today? And the students 
just started to realize, oh, there are different ways of mimicking and which one is more correct for this challenge, for example, which is making them more aware of what they're doing is always helpful. Um, the sustainable benchmarks of life's principles that I was just talking about, they remained uninternalized. So if this is the first time you've seen life's principles, I can understand that it's way out there. But let's say all of you students have been and everyone working on the challenges already knows these life's principles by heart, then that's wonderful. Then you already have them uh, internalized and embodied and in your projects. If you don't, if this is the first time, you might think, oh, this is a different language. I don't need this. Then look again and think again, because this is much more important than you might think the first time you see it. If you can embody so as many of these life's principles as possible, your project will thrive better and come out better in the whole within the challenge. So these are very, very important. I could have a whole lecture. I could have 10 lectures just about life's principles. So we can always come back to that if anybody is interested. We also learned that these learner generated drawings by hand that are on the blackboard, they did them on iPads, they did them on in their sketchbooks when looking to nature, all this hand drawing really, really helps the student internalize the strategies and mechanisms from nature. So it was very, very important to not just copy a picture from the scientific journal article and put it in the, the uh, nature technology summary that the students make on each organism. That is, that is too easy, just copy paste. That really doesn't internalize what is actually happening here. So if you have to draw the biological mechanism, that's one step of helping you understand it. But if you translate that and you have that abstracted design principle text and you draw that diagram of the new strategy and mechanism that you can use for your design, that is helping students internalize what is actually happening there. So that's a tip I can give you, draw and hand draw as much as possible. And don't forget, that these organisms that are, are teaching you these amazing things, these awesome strategies and mechanisms, you need to appreciate that as well. There's also this whole world out there of organisms that we might be losing every, you know, su such important information, not might be, we are use, losing this important information every single day. So go out there, adopt the organism, and reconnect to nature and you know, think about the ethical design decisions that you need to make. So I think I'm almost there. <laughs> um, how did I implement uh, systems level thinking? Well, we also looked to each of the challenges, put the challenge in the middle and then branching out, looking, making systems map of all the stakeholders, all the energy and materials that go in and out of the system also helping the students think about what is happening, like where is your design going to function? So what we, when we make something, we might think it's improving a system, but it might also just make things worse. So it's very, very important to look and see how uh, the system is working and where could you implement a change? Where could you turn some knobs and inter, uh, intervene and make a change? So this is an important exercise also to do to improve the systems level. This is an example of a team called Nature Inspired Cooperation. They were finalists last year of the um, Global Biomimic Bio Global Design Challenge, where they looked to slime molds, where they looked to the bromeliads, where they looked at to the zebra finch for the feedback loops, to the clownfish and the sea anemone for mutualistic relationships and to the Brazilian nut tree and the orchid bee and wild orchid. So looking at these different organisms, they put all the information together and they came up with an information platform, which is to cultivate the cooperative relationships and, and create mutualistic relationships within a system. Now, the system they were working on is speeding up the energy transition in the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, we use a lot of gas, natural gas, which you might say, well, that's, that's pretty environmentally friendly, but it's very limited because we're taking gas out of the ground. Then we're getting earthquakes up in, in the north of the Netherlands. And we want to be uh, independent to be able to supply our own energy system. And I think that there's 
there's enough technology and we know how to do it, but it's about getting the people within this ecosystem all going in the same direction. So getting them to work together as in a mutualistic and symbiotic system. And so this is a, a, a team that has also become a startup and a very, very interesting multicultural, multi-background uh, group of students who are still working on this project. So it's uh, quite an interesting project. And as you saw also looking and focusing on sustainable development goals. Uh, I can show you from looking at the systems thinking and mentioning from form process system and uh, having students realize the differences and realizing the importance of systems thinking. In 2019, none of the students were mimicking systems. And then you saw in 2020, you see, you see an increase in that. And then in 2021, uh, more increase. And then in 2022, Maybe it shows a, a slightly smaller amount of systems thinking, but the process and the behavior has increased dramatically. So throughout this, uh, the, this challenges and the improvement, improvements that are brought into the education system, students have been able to think at the higher levels because mimicking form is something that you can see, you can touch, you can, you can it is more obvious, but mimicking behavior and processes, that's that, that's that's a little deeper thinking going into the but mimicking the entire system is incredibly difficult. So the students have increased their awareness and understood better about how they are going into the, the, the organism and the system. So why have I been doing this biomimicry design engineering education research? Well, it's been it's been so helpful to understand different, uh, challenges, how we could address the challenges in a totally different way. It's been awe-inspiring to look at the stingless bee, to look at passive ventilation systems, for example, to look at smart facade element elements, such as the, the giant air plant uses, or to learn from systems to stimulate the mutualistic and symbiotic relationships as the slime mold does. So this has been uh, an exciting journey and uh, just making me more excited about biomimicry and using biomimicry. In Thank 2019, you, we had... Oh, I have to stop. Time's up. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Laura. Will... It must be an interesting journey, uh, it, biomimicry, and also relate to entrepreneurship. Um, due to the time constraint, actually, uh, yeah. we would like you to answer one of the very important questions from the audience before we wrap up. Okay. So do you think biomimicry can also be applied in our society in terms of social or humanity? If yes, can you please give an example? Does this relate to what you say about measure life principles? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, this is exactly what I meant by that last project that was looking at um, creating mutualistic relationships. If you look at the organisms on Earth that really work together, we can learn a lot for social behavior. If you look at the honeybees, for example, for making democratic decisions, if you look at the, the coyote and the badger on how they work together to uh, find prey, if you look at the, the, like the clownfish and the sea anemone protecting each other in certain ways. So you look to see what your, your social innovation needs to do, what do you want it to do, and then look for the organisms that already do that. Thank you, Dr. Laura Lee Stevens. It's a very interesting insight. We would definitely love to hear from you more. Uh, uh, yeah, really an expert in biomimicry. Um, <laughs> we, due to time constraint, we will have to uh, move on to our second speaker. So thank you and hope you can be with us. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, if the audience have any questions, I will actually direct them to you. I hope that's okay with you. Thank you very much yes. for your time today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the second speaker. The, our second speaker will be Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Fidaus Abong Abdullah. He is a lecturer at the School of Computing and Creative Media, University of Technology, Sarawak, Malaysia. He holds a PhD and a Master of Science in Industrial Design from Roboro University, United Kingdom. His area of expertise includes uh, 
in design, modularity, medical application of design, biomimetics in design, and grassroots innovation. Without further ado, let's hear from Dr. Muhammad Fidaos, an expert in creating products that can be both practical and aesthetically pleasing. He uses his knowledge from applied science as well as applied arts and various engineering disciplines to teach his students on how to design products that are beautiful and of course functional in equal measures. He will provide us with many biomimicry engineering ideas for you to think of. His talk today, Biomimicry Engineering Ideas, will focus on giving you just the right dose of inspiration you need to find your next innovation ideas. Dr. Buhar Fidaos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Siu Kien. All right, um, following Dr. Laura's uh, presentation just now, it was uh, very interesting. So, uh, yeah, uh, as uh, what uh, Dr. Laura was uh, presenting just now, just now, it is uh, very interesting uh, regarding uh, biomimicry and uh, biomimetic, biomimetic yeah, or biomimicry. It's a really brilliant idea for design. Yeah, so uh, I won't be explaining regarding uh, what is biomimicry. So what are the ethos? How do you emulate it? How you can reconnect with nature? and uh, also on the form, process, system, and analogies, because it, it has all been explained by Dr. Laura just now. So I might be <clears throat> straight to the ideas on, uh, on the ideas of uh, how to help the students, yeah? To, uh, okay, this is very important. Yeah, because, because uh, I've uh, been given a quick, uh, quick uh, notice on this so i have to uh, to put on a quick presentation and most of my uh, image that i'm using are from the internet yeah so a short profile of myself i don't have to go through this again because uh, uh, i arma have uh, announced me just now so thank you very much again miss uh, i arma yeah so Nature has long inspired human for good and for bad, yeah. And uh, it has been, uh, it has been uh, biomimetic. Actually, has been has been uh, around for a long time, yeah. It's been around for a long time, and uh, it's not just recently or now that uh, the biomimetic uh, ideas has been uh, applied in designs. Yeah, it has been uh, for quite a while. Yeah. Okay, if you look at the uh, the image that I'm uh, showing here, yeah, it is uh, it is the first ideas of how um, a caterpillar can be applied, yeah, to 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 the uh, development and design of uh, tanks, yeah. This is the uh, short um, short. I mean uh, the uh, Sketches, yeah, sketches of uh, the early tanks, yeah, that uh, apply the uh, ideas of the caterpillar, yeah, on the design of the uh, tanks, yeah, and uh, it is a uh, first uh, uh, conceived, yeah, this idea is first uh, used uh, in the First World War when. The when the first tank was introduced, yeah, during the war, and uh, this is the uh, the uh, the tank, eh? the actual tank. Okay, you, you you might be surprised because uh, my light just went off. This is uh, also uh, the uh, following the biomimicry design as well. Because if uh, if I'm not in the room, if I'm not moving, it just. Uh, Went off by itself, yeah. So I have to move myself to get the light on back, right? Okay. So this uh, uh, tanks, yeah. This tanks is the if you if you look at it, the most important part of the tank is not just the armor, okay. But uh, if you look at the design here, the most important part of the tank is the caterpillar track, yeah. The caterpillar track because without the caterpillar track, yeah, the uh, tank wouldn't move. Although you got uh, some nice armor, thick armor to protect the uh, the occupants of the tank, but you can't if uh, there is no 
uh, track, then it cannot move. So it's a useless uh, piece of uh, product. Right? Yeah. So the uh, the tracks and uh, the caterpillar tracks itself is very important. Yeah, because uh, it uh, it uh, enables the the uh, the product the tank to move around uh, and unobstructed okay and it is the best uh, uh, way to move in in terrain in in in, uh, in different kind of uh, terrain yeah if uh, so if you look at the history uh, of the uh, arctic uh, arctic exploration yeah they they first uh, use uh, this uh, uh, what we call it the sledge which is pulled by the huskies okay and eventually after that they design they start with the design of uh, of uh, this um the uh, uh arctic cruiser okay? that is what they call it the arctic cruiser okay? but unfortunately this arctic cruiser is not uh, not a good design and uh, eventually it was not used and, one of the main reason is because it is using the uh, the uh, a normal uh, wheel, okay. So after that, uh, the vehicle with with uh, caterpillar tracks was introduced, okay, and it is the best vehicle, all terrain vehicle that is uh, that is uh, used until uh, today, yeah. And uh, from that caterpillar track, yeah, a lot of different products uh, has been uh, designed and derived from the first idea of the caterpillar track. If you look at uh, some of the ideas that I'm uh, putting here, okay, it can the caterpillar track is uh, redesigned okay, in such a way that it can be it can be uh, um, used, okay, installed to a normal vehicle, yeah. And also not just for vehicle, but it is it can be transformed as well into a conveyor belt. And I'm sure this one everyone uh, cannot live with, without it. Yeah, it's especially if you if you're moving up to a higher level, right? To a higher I mean uh, to a higher floor. Okay? Everyone is looking for this uh, escalator. Yeah, because it brings you. Uh, to the higher level, okay, to the higher uh, floor, without uh, without uh, any effort, yeah, <laughs> just just stand there and it will bring you up, yeah. That is um, the caterpillar track, right? So next, uh, we are looking at this. Uh, uh, we are looking at uh, an early design, okay. If you look at the the top part here, is this. Written a secret there, yeah. So this is the first ideas uh, for for if you can guess is a submarine, yeah. It's a submersible vehicle in the early days. The submarine was uh, derived or inspired by the the whales, yeah. Whales or or any mammals, uh, sharks. And uh, why? Because uh, it is uh, difficult yeah, for 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 uh, especially in uh, in the uh, in in uh, conflict yeah or in war that uh, if uh, they use this form okay, this form of uh, uh, for 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 their vehicle it is difficult for for their enemies to to differentiate yeah, be between the the animals and also the submersible vehicle yeah so this is the uh, the early submarines that uh, were used by the germans in the first world war okay? yeah and uh, this uh, this uh, this is a very uh, okay uh, again uh, if you if you uh, uh, look at uh, this uh, from from the submarine, uh, the early submarine just now. Uh, it is developed to to help uh, um, 
it is help it is uh, developed to help uh, i mean to be used in the uh, okay just off my my voice i cannot hear myself now so if you look at the uh, the transformation of the submarine just now from from a war machine yeah, it is uh, it is uh, uh, developed and it can be used for a lot of other purposes yeah like uh, a research submarine uh, salvage submarines and also for recreational purposes if you look at the the uh, the uh, the uh, the small uh, submarine nimble submarine here it really mix, mimics the uh, the uh, whale yeah right we were we were saddened eh, before when uh, <laughs> when uh, we lost one of our flight uh, 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 some uh, few years ago, which is a flight MH370. And, and uh, a lot of uh, submersible vehicles were used to, to, uh, to uh, look for it, okay? But uh, unfortunately, until today, uh, it is not been found yet, right? So probably the ideas of uh, uh, using the current uh, design of the submarine uh, might not be enough, okay? So probably the, the, uh, the students or the, the participants of this design contest can come up with a, with a, a further, a better ideas or better uh, better um, sea animals or sea creatures that can probably go deeper or have a better sonar to detect the uh, the uh, the uh, aeroplane yeah okay and uh, i guess uh, you might have a difficulty in looking at uh, what uh, this image is about yeah so another image yeah is a uh, you might be mistaken as well if you look at this if uh, you, you said that it is a leaf yeah but this is a way of how uh, animal camouflage themselves and this is also one of the ideas of uh, biometrics yeah where um where you can uh, you can uh, get the the ideas of camouflage yeah? from uh, from uh, animals in nature to create um uh textile yeah which is uh, which can be uh, utilized for a lot of different purposes yeah uh, like for the militaries yeah uh, this is another example of a, a new camouflage which is um a digital camouflage yeah if you can see the different yeah and the normal camouflage yeah this is the one and also if you look at the digital camouflage it is much better right so it's uh, no wonder that uh, if you look at uh, a lot of uh, militaries in the world today yeah change to uh, digital camouflage for for their uh, uh, uniform yeah and uh, it is not just for military camouflage is also important yeah for for um wildlife photographer researchers yeah okay <laughs> most probably because this uh, image shows uh, the camouflage is a uh, very very good yeah i think <laughs> that uh, the leopard himself uh, does not uh, uh, recognize uh, or, or differentiate between the band the camera and uh, the uh, the uh, uh, bushes, yeah, <laughs> okay, and uh, this is another ideas, yeah, that uh, uh, student can look at, yeah, to for for the for their design ideas. Uh, probably um, some of you might have uh, know already, okay, or understand uh, what this uh, uh, beetle is going to do. Uh, it is a uh, actually a, a beetle which is found in the in the uh, um, desert, right? Which is a desert place, which is a very dry and without water. But yeah, this beetle has the ability yeah, to to uh, create its own water. Okay, how does it do that? Okay, and that is a very important aspect of. Uh, 
biomimicry as well because it helps yeah especially those uh, in the uh, in the parts and regions of the world which is uh, is um, experiencing uh, drought yeah and uh, experiencing a uh, dry uh, dry uh, season which is uh, now it's um, inconsistent yeah so the idea is to mimic the uh, the uh, beetle yeah? to catch the moisture from the air right and to come up producing its own water okay its own water by um, by catching the moisture yeah in the atmosphere right so in an area where there is no river no lake yeah this this product is very important okay this design is very important because uh, it can okay, create it can uh, uh create water yeah for 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 use in that uh, uh, region, yeah, and uh, it might the, the technology might not be uh, um, might not be uh, developed at the moment, but uh, it is still uh, under research, yeah, and uh, who knows? Maybe in the future that, that technology can really work and can really give okay, lots of water okay, for 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 the usage of the. Uh, of the uh, uh, population in that area, yeah. And uh, just to share with you also uh, that uh, uh, the research, yeah, the research and the project that uh, uh, my students are currently doing, okay. And uh, I'm supervising a group of students who is doing um, uh, ballistic protection technology based on the bio biomimicry ideas, yeah, and. We, we are looking into the biomimetic design okay, in additive manufacturing for ballistic protection uh, for, 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 the, for design of device, for design of um, uh, panels. Yeah? And uh, the student will have to, yeah, to, to go through different kinds of um, surface elements from, from plants, yeah, from uh, animals, from insects. Yeah, just to just to uh, um, to uh, investigate and to determine the 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 most uh, the most appropriate and the most um, uh, the strongest um, material. Yeah, that can be that can be produced uh, based on the design of the uh, of the uh, of the plant um, biology here, yeah. Okay, this is another another um, uh, research that they have go, to go through. Okay, as well, it's, it's quite similar just now, right? right. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the, the ideas of uh, additive manufacturing products, yeah, based on the 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 plant uh, the plant structure just now, and. All right, this is also another idea, yeah, uh, for um, ballistic protection um, product, okay, and the ideas come from uh, a type of um, mollusk, yeah, which is called chiton, okay, and this is how um, the student developed the ideas to be uh, um, to be. Uh, Design okay, into a, a knee protective uh, equipment. Okay. Thank you and, very much, Dr. Uh, Mukhafida. Um, bulletproof uh, vest as well. Right? However, it's not just for a bulletproof uh, vest. It can be applied to uh, other other kind of uh, a usage, like um, panels, uh, boards. Uh, and also our shields and all that, yeah. And this is uh, inspired by the uh, animal armadillo, yeah. This is a, a helmet, 
okay, military helmets, yeah. And uh, this is looking into the structure of the uh, the uh, of the tortoise shell, okay, which can also be developed to to become a ballistic helmet uh, structure, yeah. Thank you very much, Sukin, and all the panelists.